Good evening, Grace fans. Welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santoroski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we break down this past weekend in racing. Uh, with me tonight is um, Mr. Gray Warren, Mr. Richard Uden, Mr. Joey Barnes, and Mr. Seth Eggert. How is everybody tonight? Doing terrific, bud. Good, thank you. Doing good. I'm okay. All right. So, um, uh, Joey's just okay. Yep. I, Joey's sad because Stan Lee passed away. I told him we wouldn't mention on the story, uh, on the show, but we will. But uh, I, I, on a related note, um, we did lose uh, a gentleman that was a racing legend this week. Uh, David Pearson, the Silver Fox, uh, passed away on Monday, uh, age 83. Uh, here's a guy who's a member of the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Uh, here's a guy who's won 105 races, uh, three championships. He's won, uh, won the Daytona 500. He's won multiple Southern 500s and uh, multiple uh, Charlotte 600s. Um, and Gray, uh, you, you've had the pleasure of um, watching David Pearson race, um, which, uh, uh, you know, these other folks on the panel are, are a little too young to have uh, been able to witness um, this, that guy in action. So, uh, so uh, you know, Gray, some thoughts about um, David Pearson. Yeah, he, had a, he had a remarkable career and was a remarkable driver. Uh, you know, I watched him, I watched him as a child. Uh, a uh, young boy of, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, went to many races uh, when I was, when I was a kid and, and, and watched David Pearson race. And I can say David was probably one of my heroes and one of my favorite drivers uh, growing up. And, uh, you know, then he went to the Wood Brothers, which was always one of my favorite teams and, and essentially rewrote the record books. Uh, uh, he was written off after, uh, you know, uh, the 1970 season, of course, that was a lot of turmoil in the sport. The factories were pulling out and he lost his, and a lot of guys lost their rides and things like that. And he left home and Moody uh, during, uh, during the, those times and bounced around. And when the Wood Brothers needed a, a driver in 1972, he got the call and the rest was history. He won 43 times between 1972 and 1979 driving for the Wood Brothers. And of those 43 races, I probably was probably witnessed him win well over half of those. And, um, you know, neat thing about this sport is, you know, I sat in stands as a, as a, as a kid and never in my wildest dreams would I one day, you know, work in the same garage area with these, with these men. And I had the pleasure of doing that with Pearson and his sons later on and early in my career in the, in the, in the, old Bush series, uh, David owned a car that his son Larry drove and his other two sons, uh, Ricky and Eddie, worked worked on the car and they competed in the Bush Grand National Series. And I think, you know, they ended up winning the championship, Larry Pearson did, in, in, in 86 and 87, uh, driving uh, in a team owned by their dad. And it was kind of neat because, you you know, these guys that you, you grew up watching and, and they were larger than life legends. And then you get a chance to work with them later on, and, I, and you know I'll, I'll be forever grateful and, and and humbled and proud that you know I got to do that. And uh, Pearson was a character. I mean, he was uh, to me in, in the discipline of stock car racing. There were there was none better. He uh, he was probably the finest driver uh, that that I've ever seen in my lifetime, and and the stats bear that out. He won 105. Uh, races and, and 574 starts and that's 
that's just under 20% of the, of the, of the races that, uh, that he started. He, he actually back in the day, you know, when there was so many races, uh, he only competed in, in, the, in, in better than 80% of the races only four times in his career. And he won the championship in three of those seasons. So that, that, that in itself is, is, is quite remarkable. Just, just a, a tremendously smart racer. Uh, he won it with, uh, you know, he had, he had, he had immense talent, but he had, he just had a knack for, uh, being able to, to race. He was, he was the ultimate racer. He knew what to do when he got in the car and racing's changed a lot over the years, but you know, he was one of these guys, he and Richard Petty put on quite, quite a show over many, many years. And I think they, they finished first and second to one another in 63 or some odd 63 set. straight races. Yeah. Well, 63 races, they finished one, two in, yeah. uh, over, over their career. That's, 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 uh, that's between two guys that really defined the sport in the, uh, in the sixties and, and seventies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, some of their finishes and some of their races were epic. Of course, you can go back to the 1976 Daytona 500, which is in some people's minds, one of the, was one of the best NASCAR races ever. And, and, and well, that was Pearson's only Daytona 500 win. And in 1976, he won the quote unquote NASCAR Triple Crown, mm-hmm. the World 600, the Southern 500, and the Daytona 500. Uh, he's one of the only drivers to ever do so. Yep, and uh, you know, just it just goes it goes on and on some of the the, the accolades and things that he did, and you know, it was um, just 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 a remarkable career for a remarkable man, uh, and uh, it, it's it's sad that uh, we're losing some of these guys. Uh, And to me, he was part of the greatest generation, you know, in our sport. And a lot of those guys, and I'm not talking, I'm talking drivers and car owners and mechanics. The list goes on and on uh, of people that, and and sadly, you know, father time's undefeated and we're going to lose more and more uh, of those, uh, of those guys. Now, uh, now, his nickname, Silver Fox, part of that came from uh, his previous nickname. He was the Fox, the Sly Fox, and it became Silver Fox when his ha- uh, hair yeah. turned silver. Yeah. But the reason why is he would always uh, take care of his equipment to be around at the mm-hmm. end, oh, essentially yeah. to be the closer yep. before we had Kevin Harvick the closer. Yeah, but you 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 know back in those days racing was 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 a lot different, and you can talk to Richard Petty, and 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 I saw a quote from Richard not too long ago, and he was talking about how he and Pearson raced, and actually they they never drove or never raced n- no faster than they had to to win the race. You know they that's that was their style. They they kept kept their car in reserve. They kept themselves in reserve. And of course, it was racing was a lot different then. You know, the, the cars were the, the cars weren't as reliable as they are today. And 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 those guys use guile and 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 their wits uh, to to win. You know, you're talking 305 races uh, between the two of them in their career. And that and that and that in itself is quite remarkable. But you know, getting back to what I was saying about you know a lot of the superstars and a lot of the the, the the guys that are in the Hall of Fame now, or uh, ones that we haven't that we haven't lost already, a lot of those guys are, you know, getting up there in age. They're they're in their set late seventies, eighties, and some in their nineties. Um, and 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 slowly but surely, we're gonna we're gonna lose that whole whole generation. But we were talking today. Some friends and I were talking um, at the race shop, and you know, we're talking about a lot of you know. Uh, the great junior Johnson is not in, is not in, in, in particularly good health. And uh, Glenn Wood is, is, is 93 years old, a little bit frail, but uh, talking about some of these guys and, and there's Richard Petty, who's, who at 81 years old was in Texas uh, meeting with sponsors uh, for next year when he got the news of Pearson's passing. So, you know, and, and there's another remarkable individual in Richard Petty, uh, he comes in. To, he comes over to RCR, and I swear, when he walks across the shop, you can't keep up with him. He he walks that fast, and he's, uh, you know, and and one day we'll face 
you know, the, the loss of Richard Petty and then, you know, you know, all the icons essentially will be gone. But, you know, for me, someone like I try, try to appreciate them while they're here, try to learn from them, try to listen to their stories uh, and, and, and just have them. I love to sit down and just hear them talk about and tell their stories about how things were when they came up. And, it, and it's, it's a lot of fun to listen to those guys because uh, it's, it's a bygone generation. That, yeah, that it is. Yeah, the sport is entirely different now, and um, you know, I I like like you, Greg. I I love to engage uh, older racers in conversation. You know, whether they were uh, guys on a level of David Pearson or or just somebody who's started a couple races here and there. But every everyone's got a story to tell. So now now Seth, uh, you've got a couple more notes on some of the amazing stats that David David Pearson has put up over the years. I mean, his 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 record, you know, holds up. Uh, today is quite yeah. incredible. Well, three Southern 500 wins, uh, three World 600 wins, three Winston 500 wins. Uh, he led the Cup Series in win totals in 66, 68, 73, and 76. He led the cu- the series in polls in 1964, 68, 73, 74, 75, and 76. Uh, he was the 1960 Rookie of the Year, and in 1960, he only ran half the races that season. He won won the uh, won the World 600 the first time as a young man in 1961 as a rookie, and on the retires, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah, it was a late race, late race. He had a had a right rear left rear tire go and limped around the last couple laps to to win the race. One of the more remarkable things, he took over the Wood Brothers car at Darlington in 1972 and won his first start with the Wood Brothers. I happened to be there that day when he did, when he did. And that, that, that was, that was quite a race on that particular day. But in 1973, his first full season with the Wood Brothers, he only competed in 18 races that year and he won 11. That's 61%. Of, of the of the races in that year and that's that's still a still a high water mark, mark for uh winning percentage for a single season and not only that in those 18 races he only failed to finish four of them and the reasons clutch engine rear end and one crash aside from those four races he won 11 like you said finished second in three others and third in that fourth one how about that? I mean, that's just, it's, it was remarkable because I tell you, I was a Pearson fan, no doubt. And when you went to the, when you went to the race, you always want your favorite driver to win. But I can tell you during that streak between 1972 and 79, when you went to the race and you were, you, you know, you put your Pearson gear in more, more times than not, you were going to walk away from that racetrack, a happy camper because Pearson was, was, was going to win the race. And, you know, back in those days, I traveled around quite a bit as a, as a fan and, and had the opportunity to, to, to see him win uh, many of the races that he won at Darlington and Charlotte and Rockingham and a lot of the other places I traveled to Talladega and traveled to Pocono, saw him win races there. Uh, just, you know, just just a remarkable driver. And, I mean, he'd come along at a time uh, where where he just showed his medal week after week and uh, – uh, I mean that, that he got the name Silver. He earned that name Silver Fox because he would. Uh, he was a tremendous qualifier. He get he he win the pole, qualify near the front, and then he would just drop back and ride. And then there, with within a hundred miles of the end of the race, there he shows up again and, and goes off and, and takes off and has plenty left in reserve, you know, of his from him, of the car and himself and, and end up winning the race. So um, yeah. Just a remarkable career. I, you know, he's going to be missed, and uh, you know, he's 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 one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, he certainly will be missed. Um, and, and just um, the outpouring of uh, you know comments from uh, folks involved in the sport, you know, drivers and team owners and whatnot, has just uh, been pretty pretty incredible. Yeah, but uh, but our thoughts are with uh, his family and those that knew him best. So, but um, speaking of record books, um, we're heading into Championship Weekend. Um, in uh, Homestead in a week's time, and we uh, somebody else is set to add their name to the records book as a uh, cup champion. Our championship four is now settled with um, the big three, you know, Kyle, Martin, 
and Kevin, uh, joined by Joey Laganos. We've got uh, three guys who are all champions uh, within the era of the playoffs. And uh, Joey Logano, who's a, a runner-up once, um, I believe 2016, uh, he's come close looking to uh, uh, get the cup uh, for the first time. So, honestly, no surprises in that final four. Um, but um, it, it didn't look... It wasn't as easy as it as it uh, for all those guys. Harvick had a bit of a tough day. We had several guys with tire issues. So, uh, Seth Gray, why don't uh, you guys take us through some of the the ups and downs uh, and the ebb and flow of the the race in Phoenix? There, yeah, I mean it. It you know everybody's predicted the big three would get there all year, and and Joey Logano was the first one to bust the break into that party with his win at Martinsville a few uh, a few weeks ago, and then. We kind of had to go in and, and see how Texas and, and Phoenix were going to were going to unfold, and, and of course Texas kind of went true to form. We kind of figured Harvick was going to was going to win that race, and then we all of a sudden found out that he slapped with a with a major penalty for using an unapproved spoiler at uh, at Texas, and his win does not count to help him transfer automatically into the final four. So then we said, okay, well, he's going to go to he's going to go to Phoenix, and he proved that you know he could do it because he uh, he uh, pretty much uh, dominated practice and won the pole and dominated all but the last several laps of the first segment when he had a tire issue that uh, had it not been for the competition caution coming out at the end of the uh, stage. Uh, he would have lost two laps. As it was, he lost one lap and had to rally from one lap down, and and was was a, had a strong enough car to do that. But uh, his uh, his road to um, to get back into contention was uh, w- was a little bit difficult because he had uh, other contenders like his teammate Kurt Busch and then and Chase Elliott who were pretty close. Uh, to, to where they could, uh, you know, if had things gone different for either one of those two drivers, they could have pulled the upset and knocked uh, and knocked Harvick from the uh, from the final four. Uh, Kyle Busch went into that race with uh, with a, with a pretty good uh, um, in position as far as points. All he had to do was just run a steady a steady day, and he he would uh, he would he could he could transfer easily. And it was a good day for Kyle Busch. Uh, he ended up uh, running near the front and then late in the race, uh, well, but at, past halfway, was able to capitalize and uh, and run good and, and, and win the race and punched his ticket automatically to it. Uh, the 78 car, another story. He had to kind of come from the back and kind of and, and, and kind of had an up and down kind of day, but had a solid enough car to where he could uh, where he could maintain the points that he had garnered in earlier rounds and was able to was able to transfer, but it was a, it was an eventful race. A uh, lot of question marks there until the late, you didn't know who was going to, who was going to be able to uh, transfer and who not. So it was a lot of drama, but uh, kind of unfolded kind of like we thought it would be. And now we've, we've got the, the final four set going to Miami. And uh, I think it's a, I think it's a good final four. I think you got probably if you had to go uh, on favorites, I know Vegas, it puts uh, puts Harvick and Kyle Busch as the favorites with uh, uh, Truex next, and then and, and Joey Logano the, the the fourth pick. So uh, we'll have to see how it goes. I kind of like uh, uh, I kind of like Kyle Busch to uh, to ride the momentum of his of his win at Phoenix and 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 pick up his second uh, championship. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Seth, um, you and I were talking earlier off the air. We uh, they were several guys with tire issues. Um, we talked about Harvick, but they were all, all on Fords, correct? Correct. And it was interesting. Uh, NBC, the broadcast team, they kept uh, putting the blame on drivers going down, cutting the dog leg on what's now the front stretch. However, if that were the case, it doesn't make sense that the only teams that were affected throughout the entire weekend were Ford teams. Clint Boyer, that eliminated him from uh, any chance of getting to Homestead. Uh, Joey Logano, he, if he hadn't won at Martinsville, he wouldn't be going to Homestead with a chance for the championship. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Paul Menard in practice. Uh, every driver that lost a tire in the Cup Series 
lost uh, that that loss. It was a Ford, and it was left rear. Except for Harvick, it was a right front. Right, right. Well, it, it uh, you know, it, it, I think probably was co- coincidence. I do know that a lot of the guys that did were going were using the going and cutting the dog leg on low air pressure, which uh, which seemed to probably damage, which the people theorized damaged the sidewall on the on the uh, on the tire, particularly on the ones that suffered left rear failure. It's hard to say. I mean, I think maybe the Ford thing was somewhat coincidence because if you look, all all of those cars ran ran pretty well, and uh, Randy could have been could have been something they all got together on and shared some information on on air pressure. Any number of things could have happened uh, with that. So uh, yeah, but it, but it was unusual that it was you know all Ford teams that had had that issue. But I'm not going to read a read a whole lot into that. And one other note that I just want to say, and this is about Kyle Busch. Uh, earlier this year, he became the first driver to win on every single track, and that was back at Charlotte when he won the Coca-Cola 600. That was combining wins from both Hendrick and Gibbs and his time between Chevy and Toyota. His win this weekend, he has now won at every single track in a Joe Gibbs racing Toyota. And that is that is quite remarkable too. And that was his 194th win across all three NASCAR series. He has 51 truck wins, 51 uh, ex, uh, cup wins, and 90 what 94 uh, Xfinity wins. So somewhere that's, that's is that right? 90 92 or 90? What is it in 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 uh, Xfinity? I forget what it is, but it's 194 uh, wins across the three 92. series. 92. 92 Xfinity wins, that's it. Yeah, so um, quite quite a remarkable statistic as well for, for, for Kyle Busch when we just talked about, you know, Richard Petty and David Pearson with their, with their 305 uh, cup wins. Of course, obviously the truck series and the and – the, Xfinity series did not exist back then when, when at the height of their career, but you know, you got to look throughout most of the, most of Richard and David's career, the cup series, um, you know, consisted of, uh, 50, 60 races in a season until 19, uh, until 19, said what 72 when, uh, RJ Reynolds came along and cut and along with NASCAR cut the schedule back to 30 some races a season. So, what Kyle Busch has done in his career, and I believe he's only 33 years old, uh, quite remarkable. And, uh, you know, obviously he's a no doubt future Hall of Famer as well. Certainly, yeah. So, uh, but um, so let's, uh, so we've talked about Kyle Busch a little bit, okay? Now, uh, Joey and or Richard, I want to bring one of you guys to the conversation. And let's uh, let's talk about our championship four, okay? So, Richard, I'm going to throw you the name. Martin Truex Jr. Um, what 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 do you like? What do you don't? Uh, what do you feel like Martin's chances are? And then Joey, you'll get to talk about Mr. Kevin Harvick. Oh, okay, Martin Truex Jr. It's been an you know interesting season for those guys. Obviously, that you know the, the the big news is that they're they're pulling out at the end of the season. So this is their swung swung race for for furniture row racing. But it's been a little bit hit and miss really for Truex. You know, he's had a you know, the one, a number of five races, the one this year. Um, but it, it's certainly a very different feel from when they won the championship last year in terms of the dominance, even though the numbers are, are similar in terms of race wins. Uh, you know, really this year, you know, the Fords have sort of stepped up to, to put it to the Toyota. So, in a way, from a, a fairy tale perspective, it'd be great to see them win and go out on a high. Um, I I don't know whether they'll get it quite done this uh, this weekend. I think they're going to have to. Re- I think if if the top four all perform as expected and nobody has a you know a crazy race with some bad luck, um, I think the odds that you know Gray was talking about earlier with uh, Kyle and, and Harvick being the favourites is probably going to stand true. It's a good point. Yeah, I mean uh, Truex has not been particularly strong here at the at the. The, the waning end of the season here. I, no. I, believe, I believe I believe he's only won one race in the playoffs, or or has he won any, Seth? 
he ha- has not won since Sonoma, or sorry, Kentucky. Okay, okay so he, has, so he Kentucky. hasn't won a playoff. How many how many races has he won this season? Four. 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 Okay. So I mean, okay. it's still a pretty yeah. damn good season, but it you know how many races did you win last season? Seven, right? Eight. Yeah. Seven. So yeah, it's seven not because he won the finale. Yeah. So it's, it's so. You know, it's, it, the most he can win this season is five compared to seven. So it's not like you think where he wins five, he wins seven. It's still a pretty good season. There yeah. just hasn't been that sort of indestructible well, he, sensation. I mean, I know he led more laps than, you know, the number of laps he led last year was pretty dominant he, in itself. Yeah, they haven't had the dominance that they had last year overall. But the, I think, and, and Richard, you hit the nail on the head, the, 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 the emergence of the Ford teams this year with, with uh, Harvick and 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 the uh, Stuart Haas uh, crowd and and and, um, and Penske have taken a little bit of the uh, wind uh, out of their sails, but uh, still still a good year. He's had he's had races where he has been dominant, just not the overall dominance that he displayed on the mile and a half tracks last season. So, yeah, but still still a formidable. Uh, Foe to, to go into uh, the final race. Oh, for sure. Know. But it'll, you almost get the feeling that when he's won this year, and yeah, they have dominated races. You almost get this, you know, feeling in the back of your mind. In the same way that when other people won races last year, it was because the Fords didn't work out rather right. than they were dominant. You know, in the same way last season when other guys won, it wasn't because they did well. It was because Truex slipped up. This year, you know, you get that feeling. It's because Harvick slipped up. Right, and you know there were several races last year. We talked about you know uh, Truex wins seven races last year. There were several uh, uh, on several occasions where he had the dominant car, and for whatever reason, you know a tire failure or a, a, a yeah. snafu on pit road kept him from from. He could probably have won uh, nine or ten last yeah. year. So yeah, he was that dominant. Absolutely, yeah. So now Joey. Um, I'm, I'm giving you Kevin Harvick to discuss. Um, he's uh, pretty much most folks are calling uh, Harvick the favorite. Uh, he's been tough to beat week in, week out. Uh, I mean, even uh, even on the races he hasn't won, he's been uh, pretty darn solid. So, man, you say it's a uh, it's a good call to put all my money on uh, number four. Uh, I mean, among the four that are there, certainly I like Kevin Harvick's chances the best, but I think the biggest impact there is losing Rodney Childers for the race. Uh, and I don't think that's something that can be overstated enough is that loss because Rodney Childers is, I mean, he's the best in the business in my book. Uh, right now, I think he's probably the best crew chief in the entire garage. Uh, even over a Chad Canal, so Paul Wolf, um, any of those guys right now, I'd want Rodney Childers on the box. But good, good point because he's got a handle on on these cars as they exist today. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for Stuart Haas as an organization. I mean, and it says a lot about Kevin Harvick too. Like they come in with a Chevy package in 2014 and they light it up. And every year, we've always looked at if Kevin Harvick gets there, no matter what's going on in the world, Kevin Harvick's the favorite. And I feel like it's every year that we're discussing the finale. And if Harvick gets there, he's the favorite. And I, it's funny now, here we have an opportunity to see what they can do with a different manufacturer and a repeat what they did in 2014. But there's so many different – this is the first year that I can recall seeing it where we don't have a pure Cinderella in, in the sport uh, in the Final Four because Harvick, he's already a champion. He's already solidified himself as a champion. Um, Kyle Busch has the championship, but, you know – got in because NASCAR kind of approved it, even though he was injured and there was, in, in some ways it was kind of fluky gimmick in my book. And so this is a good yeah. way for Kyle Busch to legitimize his championship that he earned a few years ago. Uh, Joey Logano, is he going to be a future champion or the next Denny Hamlin? And then, you know, the other end of that with Martin Truex Jr. If furniture row goes out and wins his championship, how do you answer that question? If you're NASCAR that you let a, two-time championship winning team walk out of the sport. Um, so there's a lot of questions that come with this finale on who takes it and who doesn't. But, uh, you know, there's, I think the other valid point to this whole thing on why Harvick is a good, good pick for this weekend, regardless of Rodney Childers not being on the box is I'm not going to say that 
how do I say this nicely uh, without getting in too much trouble? Um, I feel like you can push the envelope and, you know, it's one of those attitudes of, I dare you to take a championship away from me. Because yeah. that right there is something historical that we've never seen. It's like, we don't think, you wouldn't expect NASCAR to make a call in Phoenix of who's going to be in the championship for. Like the penalty that you saw in Texas with Harvick and that, I wouldn't expect, regardless of anything, to see that kind of an impact make, made after Phoenix. And I damn sure don't think that we're ever going to see something like that made after Homestead. So if you want to push the envelope in Homestead, I certainly think you do. And, I mean, a mile and a half, so you got to like Harvick's chances. But this isn't a D-shaped oval. Yeah. Um, and I think to that end, it could work out in Truex's favor to some degree because at the end of the day, you still got all your stuff from last year. You were the dominant car last year, a quick car last year. Uh, so who's to say that they haven't kept one car in reserve that they've been just holding on to, waiting for this specific moment to make sure that they can just unload everything they got into this race? So to go and make that point for Richard on, on Truex, like that's all well and good, but I'm going to stick with the mile-and-a-half master this year with Harvick. Uh, I don't see how he can be beat this weekend personally. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a role. It's essentially a role reversal from from last year, Harvick versus Truex, because you made a good point where you know uh, Harvick's going in with a lot of confidence and daring people to 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 take it take it from him. He feels like it's his championship there to to take, and and Truex went in last year with the same same mindset. Yeah, you know, I, when they went in, they went in on high, and and it's, it's you know he went in and said, hey, this is my championship. You got to come take it from me. I think the one thing that works against this whole scenario is the fact that we don't run Homestead at all during the season. And so if there's one thing that works against Harvick, I, he didn't also, another note on this, he doesn't have his car chief either. Like both car chief and crew chief were suspended. So it's a situation where, you know, when you're when you're talking about, you know, tire data and, and stuff from practice, stuff that you're going to try to move forward with for the race, stuff that's vital to, to what you learn Friday and Saturday, you're going with a little bit less, but let's be honest here. Stewart Haas Racing, they got, got some depth. depth over. They got a yes, lot sir. of depth over there. So, um, I'm interested to see if this plays out because we all heard this past weekend people talking to Kyle Busch. You know, hey, maybe you should have let Almirola win that race because you know you don't have to deal with Harvick in the finale. And I mean, Kyle Busch, Kyle Busch, he wants to go win the race. And you know what, if he shouldn't be intimidated at all by anybody because if he were to let Almirola win, then I'm questioning, well, are you afraid of him? Like, yeah. So we're about to seriously get the kind of slugfest we've been waiting for. And with the mile and a half package that's coming next year, I think we should all just kind of savor and enjoy this weekend because there's no telling what we're going to see next year out of these mile and a half. So um, I encourage everybody to get in front of a TV or get to the grandstands and enjoy this one for what it's worth because we got yeah. the four best drivers this year. Yeah, this, will be, this will be a good one. Yep. So, and speaking of the fourth driver that we haven't touched on, uh, Joey Logano, who's he's only won twice this year, but he's been consistently in the top five, top ten all year long. He's had a lot of really strong finishes. He's been strong week in and week out, and he's he's been of the you know of the uh, of the four. He's been the, the most outwardly aggressive one. Uh, where he's you know he got called out by Truex and called out by somebody else. They don't like the way he raced races them uh but, but but here's a guy who's you know he's not going to give up you know he's gonna he, he's gonna he's gonna push the issue we saw that at martinsville he's gonna he you know he's gonna he, he's gonna do what he needs to do to win that race and he's uh he's the underdog he's got absolutely nothing to lose so seth seth what do you think on, on joe logano logano his chances to kind of uh play spoiler for these uh for these big three Well, it's almost kind of like he's trying to go for redemption because this is his third time in the playoffs, in uh, at least at Homestead anyway. He was in there in 2014. Car fell off the jack after he had one of the most dominant cars at Homestead, costing him a chance uh, that year. Uh, 2016, he ran in or had a run in with Carl Edwards, ended Carl Edwards' day, caused enough damage to his car where he was able to essentially not keep up with Jimmy Johnson. That's what gave Jimmy Johnson his seventh championship. 2015, he lost his chance at Homestead after the Matt Kenseth fiasco at Martinsville. And last year, if it wasn't for that encumbered win at Richmond, whatever they lost at Richmond last year, they were out to lunch the rest of the season. 
So this is a little bit of a redemption, somewhat like a Cinderella story, but at the same time, he's kind of the most hated driver of the bunch when it comes to the fan base, other than maybe Kyle Busch. Yeah, he's wearing a black hat, for sure. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, I think he has a good chance to win at Homestead, at least the championship, that is. But at the same time, he might need a little bit of help, maybe some bad luck for him, say Harvick or Kyle Busch. Yeah. You know, in the in past years, we've always seen the championship four rise to the occasion and pretty much settle the race among themselves. We could have a situation this year where – Someone else plays a spoiler, wins. We've had spoilers win it before, but well, where? But this year, you have a spoiler come in and and, and take the race and have these guys settle it, racing for the next highest position. Uh, when I think of that, I think of Kyle Larson, who the last several years has had a dominant car there and ha- and, and and capable of winning. And so we'll just have to see. Uh, see what goes on. I mean, if anybody's due to win one this year, certainly Kyle uh, Kyle Larson is due to pick up a win before the season finishes. And yeah, I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in each year since we've had this playoff format, the, the Homestead winner has also been the champion. Is that correct? For the Cup Series, yes. Right, yes. right, yeah. And, and yeah, we've got we've to save some time to talk about Xfinity, too, because they had a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, race down there in Phoenix as well. As did the trucks. Now, <laughs> now, real, real quick, yeah, because uh, I, I want to save some time for Formula One too. But let's, uh, let, let's just go around and solidify our picks. Uh, um, Gray, you said you like Kyle Busch. You want to stick with that? Yeah. All right. Now, uh, Joey, you say you like Harvick. You want to stick with that? Yeah. Um, now, Seth, who do you like? For the championship, Joey Logano. Okay. And then Richard? Harvick. Harvick. And I'm going to I'm gonna go with Kyle Busch as well. So, Nobody's uh, picking Truex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nobody's picking Truex. Golly. Yeah, Poor guy. Yeah, no re- got, guy's hey, got no respect. <laughs> hey, before we before we jump away to, do, to, to let Seth give us a recap of Xfinity and, uh, and the truck series, Joey had a had a uh, comment here in in the in the chat and wanted to know if if anyone in racing today reminds me of David Pearson in any way, and and of course racing has changed so much today. Now the races races back in those days were marathons and 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 they're more like sprints today, and uh, really no holding back and you've got the stages and things like that. But I would say probably just out there today, probably with just his smarts in the driving in the seat, uh, Kevin Harvick probably reminds me as much of David Pearson today in just how he uh, how he keeps himself in the race uh, during it. Jimmy Johnson's pretty good too, at, at, but those two guys right there, both of them use their use their heads a lot too, and and uh, and and rely on their experience to. Uh, Doing so that, those two right there remind me more uh, or close to the same type of uh, driver as, as David Pearson was. Good analogy, Gray. Yeah. So, so Seth, um, Christopher Bell needed to win in Phoenix to keep his chances alive, huh? And he did just that. Um, Justin and, Allgaier, different story, huh? Uh, well, exactly. So. And for Christopher Bell, he did that in. A lot more. He started 38th after not being able to clear tech prior to qualifying, and he was able to work his way through the field. And he dominated the race, leading just under half the race in total. Uh, he needed to win. He won the race. Justin Allgaier. There was a point which Allgaier could have made it in on points. Uh, he Allgaier won the first two stages. Ended up getting into to it with another driver and he eventually lost his brakes. Uh, at one point, Allgaier was limping around the track late in the race with the right front brake caliber on fire. It was visibly on fire throughout the entire time. And uh, eventually, 
went out, but he had no brakes and he was limping, just hoping for a caution, hoping that something would happen up front that would make it so maybe Daniel Hemrick won or Matt Tift won, somebody who was already in on points that would have allowed him to bump up ahead of Christopher Bell or uh, somebody else. Elliot Sadler also had an atrocious day. He had damage early on, ended up getting knocked out. Uh, the championship four in the Xfinity Series ended up being Christopher Bell, Daniel Hemrick for the second year in a row, Cole Custer, and Tyler Reddick. Cole Custer, if you remember from last year, he absolutely dominated Homestead, led, I think, all but maybe five laps. Yes, yeah, so th- this is going to come down to a, a bit of a barn burner, too, with that Homestead. You, you got four really good guys there, and then you've got other guys out there that can certainly play spoiler. You know, exactly. namely, na- namely, like, you know, guys like all guy Elliot Sadler or even um, t- to a lesser extent, Austin Sindrick. Exactly. And th- on top of that, you also have a few other guys like Ryan Priest, who he's running part time. He could be a spoiler. You have Ryan Truex, who his future is up in the air. He needs to make something happen. Ryan Reed, same situation. John Hunter Nemechek, same situation. Oh. Uh, let me, let me inject one point today. I was over at Roush on Monday, and I was told that uh, they're shutting down their Xfinity operation. The 16 and the 60 will go away uh, next year. That's interesting. Uh, I knew I had heard uh, that they weren't planning on doing the same thing they did this year in the number 60 instead of having one full-time driver. But, again, the number 60 has been in – Incidents in 28 of the 32 races so far this year, actually setting a record for the most incidents per race in a single season mm. for the Xfinity Series. That yeah. record, that there, there, there's no trophy for that, right? Right, and that record, <laughs> uh, that record was previously held by Stephen Wallace, and that was in the 2009 season. Wow. All right, yeah, so. But- um, uh, go ahead. Uh, for the truck series, it was a heck of a race at the end. You had Grant Enfinger who needed to win to get in. Uh, one restart at the end, he just didn't get that good of a start. Noah Gregson and Brett Moffat made it three wide. Uh, Moffat ended up clearing the do- the two of them, went on to win. And Moffat, he has at times this season... There was a question as to whether or not he was going to have sponsorship for the next race, for the next two races, whether or not he was even going to make it to the track. Uh, Noah Gregson, he got in on points. If you remember at Pocono, he was so determined that to try to race, even though he was so sick, he ended up passing out uh, right before he went out to qualify. He ended up getting a waiver for that. Uh, You had Johnny Sauter, who... He had already won at Martinsville, so he was in. Justin Haley ended up blowing an engine during the race, but he won thanks to Todd Gilliland's misfortune last week, so he's in. And Matt Crafton, he just, it's just the end of an atrocious season for him. Uh, he hasn't won at all this year. He's going on, I think, a 34 or 35 race winless streak now. And he actually ran a Ford engine, a Ford OEM engine instead of the spec engine this weekend to see if maybe that would help. And the team just had issues the entire weekend with the engine. It's a bummer. Yeah. So, all right. So who are the four, the championship four again in trucks? Brett Moffitt, Noah Gregson, Johnny Sauter, Justin Haley. All right. So we've got uh, 12 guys going into Homestead, three champions coming out. Um, it's going to be a going to be a big weekend of racing. I, I want to shift our gears over to open wheel. Talk about Formula One in a little bit here. Um, um, for for the record, Joey saying Moffat for the title. Seth, do you want to do you want to pick an Xfinity and a and a truck uh, titleist before well, we move on? Well, for the trucks, I'm saying Brett Moffat as well. For Xfinity, uh, I think I'll go out on a limb and say Daniel Hemrick. Daniel Hemrick, okay. Gray, do you want to? You care to pick champions for truck and uh, Xfinity? Christopher Bale and Johnny Sauter. Oh, all right, and, and um, I know you're saying Moffat for truck. 
marks do you like for Xfinity? Christopher Bell. A mile and a half at Joe Gibbs Equipment. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. All right, Richard? Uh, Bell and Soda, I think. No, Bell and Muffet. Bell and Muffet. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Bell and Muffet. Uh, for me, so uh, so let's uh, turn our attention to Formula One. And before we start to talk about the Grand Prix, um, favorite Formula One diva Fernando Alonso has now made it uh, made it clear that he will be back at Indianapolis in May uh, with McLaren. Um, McLaren says it will be uh, their own efforts. Uh, it won't be in a uh, Andretti car with a uh, you know McLaren logo. Well painted on the side there, uh, but it will be a McLaren entry. They also have said that they're not entirely um, against a second entry, although uh, Michael Andretti says that they will be involved uh, somehow, you know, probably, you know, lending technical support like it will be with Steinbrenner. So, uh, so Joey, um, I mean, what are you hearing about McLaren? They're going to they're gonna bring a bunch of folks over from walking, um, and they're saying they're not. Uh, well, well, sorry, so, so, so. sorry, sorry. Woking? Where is it? Wo- it's Woking. Oh, Woking. my good grief. Oh, yeah. my good grief. I, I took this slip road. You said walking. <laughs> I my did. My goodness. Yes. Um, good job right, on the so, show. Joey, it, talk, really. talk about McLaren. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, whenever I was in Austin a, a few weeks ago, I mean, they said that they didn't want full-time entry. Alonzo didn't want full-time entry, neither did Zach Brown, uh, at least for next year anyway. Uh, they did still open the doors for the possibility of an Indy return, and as we heard in Brazil uh, this past weekend, they went ahead and confirmed that. And, you know, whenever I was talking to Zach Brown a couple of weeks ago, he even said, when we come into IndyCar, we want to come in as McLaren Racing, uh, not necessarily a partnership, not anything like that. So it's not really a surprise to see that. I do think we're going to see two cars. The second car might be uh, a partnered entry and to some degree, I think. But, I mean, when you look at the, the budget they have with F1, I, I think they can afford to go IndyCar racing for at least the Indy 500. Who uh, the second driver? That's, that's the interesting question. But I was kind of hoping personally that we would see a talent like Van Dorn give it a go. Uh, that was exactly who I was going to think, yeah. yeah. I think there's still I mean, some – I still think McLaren are – you know, you, you could see almost a Kvyat situation with, with Van Dorn and McLaren there. I could see him coming back in the future, and I think they want to try and keep him close to their chest in a way. Yeah, I mean, because to me, Van Dorn is top-tier talent. I mean, if you put him – he is – he is maybe like five or seven years older than Charles Leclerc, but I, he has got close to the same talent level as Charles Leclerc. And, ta- and Leclerc is over at Ferrari so um, for next year. So I think that when we look at this, though, I mean, Alonso's going for the Triple Crown. Let's not forget that you know Juan Pablo Montoya is still somebody out there chasing the Triple Crown, too, uh, folks. I mean, he's he just needs a Lamar win, and he... He begs that, and he's the other guy joining Graham Hill. So, um, yeah, I think that you know, I'd almost would rather see somebody offer, you know, JPM a solid Lamar ride, you know, and 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 see uh, see who gets it first, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, the the kicker here, though, I mean, let's. I think it's. How do I say this nicely? Uh, when oh, just we say it how you mean it. Don't be nice. <laughs> when we saw what Alonzo did uh, in 2017, that was in the a different Arrow Kit era, and he was in the preferred Arrow Kit. Uh, obviously, he's an immense talent. We already know that as far as as far as everything that he was given, it was the best that they possibly could give him to make sure that you know, because we all know that that no matter what we have in racing teams, etc. Drivers are really what everybody follows. Drivers are what make sports what they are. And we know that at the end of the day, if Alonzo bags the Triple Crown at Indy, that is a monumental moment in sports history. Not even motorsports, just sports history in general. And to have it happening at Indy on American soil is a huge deal for everybody involved here in the States. Uh, Everyone with the series and everyone in motorsports that's been a part of Monaco and and Le Mans. So to that end, it's massive. Uh, but that's why a couple years ago he was given the very best of the best, and that was only when he was one-third of the journey through. He goes and wins Le Mans, he comes back around. This is the very last thing he needs. Um, I'm wondering 
how well he can adapt now to a new arrow kit, to a universal arrow kit. Um, you know, there's been talks about how some drivers would prefer to go run a, a now, Tony Stewart said back in, the, uh, just, I think it was a month or so ago, if he goes and runs Indy, he wants to go run a 500 mile race at Pocono first. And, you know, you got to think that that's certainly smart to do when you think about how difficult the passing was for this car. I mean, in, there's some guys that can pass cars at will. Rossi certainly one of them. This is a different type of racing at Indy, and I'm kind of curious to see how aggressive Alonzo is willing to be because if you're too aggressive in these things, you can get yourself in trouble. Uh, that said, as much as everybody's so excited about Alonzo, I personally am super more excited about, if that's even a word, about um, McLaren coming in because I think this is just the first step towards – a uh, full-time investment in IndyCar. Zach Brown's made no secret of his commitment to wanting to come racing in the States on a full-time basis because he wants to expand the McLaren brand. It's, he says it's important for all the partners that are involved, all the all the chairman. And to that end, I think that we're looking probably around the time that new rules uh, situation comes in that we're going to have, have McLaren in on a full-time basis. So, um I'm excited to see it. I mean, two full-time, two entries next year in the Indy 500, potentially one for sure. Uh, everything continues to go forward in the right direction with IndyCar, and I think if nothing else, this solidifies that we're going to have once again another bump day, and that's always fun. Yeah, I was uh, figuring up the numbers. I, I think we may have as many as 38 uh, yeah. con- confirmed entries as of this point. You know, that's. And then that's a solid number. That's not that's not uh, guessing. Those are so. I mean, you're gonna you're not just gonna have uh, you know two cars on the sideline. There's gonna be a couple. It's gonna be it's gonna be a pretty exciting month of May. Book your hotel now. You <laughs> Sorry, know, you so. just said you're not gonna have two cars bumped out. You're gonna have a couple. Okay. Yeah, a, co- a couple more, several. Okay, is it? Are, you want to talk about racing, or you just want to correct my grammar and <laughs> pronunciation all night? You I really, mean, I mean, y'all give me a complex here, man, making me feel bad about myself. W o k i n g. There's uh-huh. no a l in there. I'm just yeah. saying. Well, isn't that isn't that that show um, in about the zombies in England, The Walking Dead? Oh, so. Stay, stay woke, oh, Frank. Boy. Oh, um, hey, speaking of zombies in England, let's talk about. Uh, the Formula One race uh, down in Brazil. Lewis Hamilton taking his, uh, what, 112th win on the season? That's uh, funny. It feels yeah. like, yeah. So, uh, I, But it was his uh, ninth, right? I, I mean, this race was a good race. In it was a good race, yeah. 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 So, um, take, it was take helped, it through it, guys. It was helped by Esteban Ocon there, wasn't it, Richard? Esteban yeah. Ocon sure had um, fun. Goodness gracious. Uh, yeah, it was... Um, you know, not his, uh, not the crowning glory of his, uh, you know, his career. Um, it, it was interesting, you know, through the whole weekend, the tire strategies that a lot of the teams and the played out throughout the weekend. You saw Ferrari, um, you know, run a strategy in qualifying where they went on the uh, soft tire rather than the super soft tire for uh, Q2, which meant they could start on a different tire from everybody else. Uh, and you had Red Bull sort of openly admitting, "Hey, look, we know we, we because of the uh, the configuration of the circuit, you know, they knew they were never going to, you know, get on the front row of the grid. So they openly turned around and said, hey, look, we're setting our car up for the race.' And oh boy, did it show! Um, you know, their middle fantastic. their middle sector was incredible. Well, and that's and and that's you know, fair play to the fair play to them. They knew they were quick. That you know, you, they knew that's where they had." the ability and uh, they made it pay. So you've got to, um, you, hey, you've got to give these guys credit where, uh, where credit's due. They, they did the business there. Um, and, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, it's a shame teams don't do that, you know, more often more people set themselves up for race rather than qualifying trip. Well, if you, everybody did that, you would never, <laughs> you'd be back to the same point. You know, you'd, you'd never see any very vari- variation in the, in the performance. So, I think it was good that they took that, uh, you know, through that sort of, um, you know, bit of a Hail Mary sort of thing, you know, go, go put all their eggs in one basket. And uh, it played out because it's a fantastic race, a fantastic drive by uh, Verstappen to carve his way through the Red Bulls and then put, uh, put you know, put the pressure oh, sorry, uh, through the Ferraris and uh, put, uh, you know, pressure on the uh, on the Mercedes like he did. And then, of course, you're just saying, what, you know, 20, 20, 25 laps to go or whatever. Esteban Ocon had uh, come in and uh, changed onto the super soft tyres, which are by far and away the fastest tyre out there. And uh, he was sort of carving his way back through the field and, and came across 
came across, uh, uh, you know, Max Verstappen in the lead there. And, you know, we, we'll debate this if we had longer. We'd debate it all night, I'm sure. He, he, was, he was clumsy. Uh, I think the majority of the blame, you know, sits on Ocon's shoulders. Not all of it, far from it. I think that uh, Verstappen should have been aware and not have the, the I don't want to use the word arrogance, but you know, think, well, I'm the leader, I know where I'm going to be, nobody else should be there. And it doesn't always work that way. But I think, and I don't know, they may have done, I, don't, I haven't heard any of the transcripts, but um, you know, Red Bull should definitely have told Verstappen, hey, look, Ocan's on a different set of tyres to you let him through, you know, or at least be more aware of him. Don't pinch um, him in turn seven. Yeah. Um, and, and you see, I, you know, also, you know, you, maybe a little bit of the, the blame lies and force into your shoulders. They should have, you know, gone down the pit wall there and said to Red Bull, hey, look, guys, we're coming through here. We're going to be pretty fast. So let your guy know just to... And, and the frustrating thing is Ocon could have just sailed past him into turn four. Uh, yep. There was no need for him to do what he did where he did it. I don't have an issue with lapped cars and lapping themselves, um, but everybody's got to be, you know, on the ball and playing, you know, playing, playing fair. And um, now we're going to uh, get another. Are we going to get the lucky dog in Formula One now? Because this no, is of course an issue. no, no way. No, I think that's oh. contrived racing, and I hate that. Um, but I think. Um, you know, I, I think he was unf- I think he was unfair on on, on um, Verstappen. I think you know the whole bitch slap or whatever it was that uh, Verstappen pulled after the race was petulant and stupid, and you know, not, even, not would... even something that warranted public service. No, but you know, with the cameras on everybody and every, you know, I mean, I kind of wound him up a little bit, didn't he? I mean, he apparently. When Verstappen turned around to him and said, "What the hell were you doing?" I can turn around and said, "I was faster than you." Um, so I probably, you know, I can see how that would wind Verstappen up. But you know, he, he needs to. Um, if Verstappen's not careful, there's no real sort of, you know, we'll use the word bully boys in, in Formula One. But somebody could take him into a dark room and say, "Hey, sort this out." You know, don't do that again. Because no matter what Ocon did and what his mentality was, he shouldn't have done what he did. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think the the few points that I'll that I'll make before we, I know we're about to jump off here. But uh, number one is uh, Mercedes locking up the constructors' title uh, yeah. that happened this past weekend. Um, they needed they needed to go ahead and do that uh, to keep it from going Abu Dhabi. They did. This is the third straight race weekend that I think Max Verstappen has driven absolutely beautifully. Um, Outside of that little issue, that's not totally his fault. He was still gaining ground on Hamilton despite a damaged board, um, yeah. uh, damaged floor. I just He was gaining two, three-tenths a lap for the last 20 laps to at least make it interesting. And then uh, my other thought is here we are again. Uh, Kimi Raikkonen is out running Sebastian Vettel and has been doing that since the summer break. And I'm just kind of – it puts it in my mind. Is is this the right situation for Ferrari next year moving forward at Vettel and, and Leclerc? Cause, and are you going to let Leclerc challenge Vettel? Because at this point, I think Vettel's somebody that needs to be shook a little bit. Um, that's just my opinion. Well, you saw that at Red Bull, didn't you, when uh, you know Daniel Ricciardo sort of put him, you know, um, you know, sort of you know, upstaged him, basically. Um, you know, and uh, um, I think, you know... I mean, basically, let's put it this way. You know, Ferrari were never going to keep Raikkonen and get rid of Vettel, were they? No. Um, yeah, you know, it was never going to happen. And, uh, you know, m- maybe part of, you know, Raikkonen's upturn in performance has been, you know, pressure's off to a certain extent. You know, he's not having to sort of fight for his, his drive now and he can just go out and do what he enjoys doing. You know, you can quite easily see that in, in Kimmy's personality. You know, he doesn't care. You know, he could go out there and run you know, 15th all race, and if he's enjoying himself, he, he's not going to be bothered. Um, so, yeah, you know, it'd be interesting to see what happens next year with Leclerc, but I think, uh, yeah, I think if Leclerc sort of steps up to Vettel, I could see, you know, Vettel sort of jump into a Mercedes or something, you know, as soon as the, you know, he doesn't like to hang around if he's being beaten by a teammate. The uh, the final news that came out for the F1 weekend are, are two separate things. Number one is, uh, Formula One is not being coy about telling historical tracks that, hey, 
you need to step up your game. We're not obligated yep. to give you a date. Uh, so if you're upset, you know, tough, find a way to fix it. Uh, secondly, uh, F1 is officially going to Vietnam uh, in 2020. So uh, that stage has been set already. They've already got the track layout in mind. And um, so, yeah, we're going to be, uh, in some ways, I look at it as replacing Malaysia um, in some degree. So, uh, you know, it's it'll be good. We get a street course again, and, and F1 is going to Vietnam. All right. Yes, and we uh, yeah, we covered that last week a little bit, too. So, uh, but anyway, until next week. So, Formula One has a, a week off, and then we're uh – I'm um, on to the season finale at Yas Marina on the weekend, the weekend after Thanksgiving. Uh, but for tonight, we are out of time. I'm so want to thank you, uh, Joey and Richard, for your Formula One segment. Uh, Gray um, and Seth, thank you for the for all the NASCAR news today. Um, and I want to thank uh, Hoobazoo Radio Network, and I want to thank iHeartRadio. And lastly, I want to thank all you folks that listen to us week in and week out. Um, we'll talk to you in one week. Good night. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-S-U-B-Z-O-C-O-M W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-S-U-B-Z-O-C-O-M Enter website, enter website, enter website, enter website.